welcome to First United Methodist Church to our awakening service today. So glad to see you all for worship. I'm Becky Brown, associate pastor here, and um, it is going to be a wonderful day to worship God today. Um, if you're visiting with us, welcome. We're glad that you're here. We hope that you'll join us as you exit today. I'd love to get to know you. As you saw in the video, today is an important day for the Missions Marketplace. It opens officially today. Um, you can see more about it in this really neat bookmark um, that has been in your bulletin. This is a way for you to understand how to go about it because it's all online. So please do take this opportunity to check out some wonderful things, um, maybe after worship, you know. But um, <laughs> you can also check it out while, while we're in worship because we want you to make sure you're giving to these wonderful organizations. So we hope that you'll check that out. Also, um, today is an important day where you see the prayer shawls um, all along our altar and our altar railing here. Um, we're going to have a moment to learn more about the prayer shawl ministry and bless some hands of those who work in that ministry, and that's going to be a wonderful part of our service. And we also will have a baptism at the end, so it's going to be a wonderful day to worship God today. I want to let you know about a few things. If you ordered your pecans, they're here, and there's information about how to, how to find those in our bulletin. We have, um, uh, tomorrow will be our charge conference and our leadership team meeting at 6.30 in this room over here, the faith classroom. Everyone is welcome to come if you'd like to come and learn more about what's happening at the church. You're welcome to join us there or on Zoom. There's a Friendship House open house next Sunday. You can learn about how to get to know the Friendship House and learn about the ministries there. Um, so check that out in the bulletin. As well as uh, we are in need of volunteers and cranberry sauce for our upcoming turkey jam, which will be Monday the 21st in the church parking lot. So if you're able to do that, we'll be having a big drive through opportunity for folks to come through who would like some assistance and putting together their Thanksgiving meal. So we hope that you will be a part of that together. Also, there's an insert about the Holy Land trip that Keith and I are going on um, this March. And if you have any interest at all in knowing more about that or have been thinking about it but are not sure if you're ready to commit, please do see Keith and I. We'd love to share some more information with you, and we'd love for you to travel with us on that trip. Also, this past Friday, we celebrated Veterans Day. And we'd like to recognize our veterans in our worship service. Um, so if you have served um, in any branch of our military, would you please stand so we can thank you for your service? We have any veterans among us? Thank you. We so appreciate all that you have done um, to create a safe country for all of us to live in, and we are grateful for all that you continue to do um, to serve God in the ways that you do today. So let us stand and greet one another with Christian love. All right, we're going to learn a new song this morning called Graves in the Gardens. I'm going to teach you the verse first. And then we'll go in the chorus, just so you kind of have a, a feel for how the song goes. So the verse goes like this. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. So you kind of got a feel for the verse. Now the chorus goes like this. Oh, there's nothing better And you 
putting me back together Every desire is now satisfied Hearing your love Alright, sing it Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you Strong. 
children's message this morning that Rachel's going to give on the screen. Um, Becky's going to come up for a time. I mean, um, Terry's going to come up um, for a time of congregational prayer. If there's a, a prayer concern that you have this morning or any time during the week, that's our congregational care uh, phone number. It's on there. You can uh, leave a text on there or call if there's ever a need or a struggle you're going with or joy that you want to share. If you want to keep it confidential, just let the pastors know that and it'll stay in the congregational care team. Um, but kids, sit tight. Because Here's Miss Rachel. It's impossible not to notice at this time of year that the leaves are falling off of the trees. And when they fall off the tree, they die because the leaves can't survive off of the trunk of the tree. The trunk is the source of life. It brings nutrition and water up to the leaves. It's the foundation of the tree. Just like the trunk is the foundation of the tree, the Bible is the source and the foundation of our beliefs as Christians. And that's why it's so important that we continue reading our Bible, that we hear stories from the Bible, that we tell stories from the Bible, so that we remember why we believe what we believe. Good morning. We have some prayer concerns this morning that I'll mention, and then uh, we'll talk a bit about the prayer shawls and uh, have some words about that. Jeff Bennington is, uh, has an aggressive form of oral cancer, and he will be going to Winston-Salem this Friday for surgery. Uh, so we pray for him. This is uh, very aggressive and uh, surgeons are concerned quite a bit about it. So we pray for him. Mary Gentry Seymour is home uh, as of Friday. She has had something of a week, a little more than a week. She had illness with infection and that one thing led to another. Anyway, we're glad she's home and I'm sure she is too. Uh, Teresa Courtney will have surgery this Wednesday in Asheville and we remember Elise McSwain she is back now she has been with her sister uh, Carol who is in hospice care and uh, so they are will be going back uh, a few weeks from now uh, to see how she is doing. Uh, Chris Kirkendall's father Rick is uh, recovering from hip surgery and so we pray for him and Dan Southern, uh, many of you know, he has been in this church for at least 25 years. He spent a lot of his time caring for the grounds and the parking lot and all the exterior parts of the church and organizing people to do that. Uh, he is retired and moved away, but he had now has uh, stage four lung cancer and is undergoing treatment for that. And on a bit of a brighter note, Lillian Coffey uh, will be 102 tomorrow. So we wish her a happy birthday. The family is there and they are enjoying their time with her. Uh, and so we look forward to her birthday tomorrow. Third graders, youth on youth trips, the people we send and the people we visit on mission trips, people at the Women's Imaging Center at Haywood Regional, two Egyptian priests, residents in the dorms at Haywood Pathways, kids 
at the Broy Hill Children's Home, and countless other people all over the world have been literally touched by our prayer shawl ministry. For over 20 years, talented people have gathered together to knit, weave, crochet, to make prayer shawls of various sizes and shapes, and make knitted goods that bring comfort to other people. Those shawls have taken the form of crosses as bookmarks when third graders receive their Bibles. They took the form of stocking caps or toboggans, depending on where you're from, uh, for the kids at Broyhill for one winter. They're full-sized, pocket-sized, all kinds of sizes. Now we even have loveys, which are knitted, stuffed animals for children who are undergoing trauma. I called it our prayer ministry. I didn't call it First United Methodist Church's prayer ministry, although it started here and it is still in this building. But people knit at home, and those who come here are not just from our church. We have people from Grace Episcopal and St. John's Catholic Church as well. And all of these people, as they knit, weave, crochet, make their prayer shawl, whatever size, whatever shape, they are offering prayers, healing prayers, for people they don't know, will probably never know, in places they've never been at a time that they don't know either. But they pray knowing quite rightly that in God's good time, the prayer shawl, the pocket prayer shawl, the lovey, the hat, whatever they've made will find its way to the right person and bring that person the courage, the comfort that comes with the presence of God. Let us pray. Gracious and giving God, you are the giver of all good gifts. Among these many and varied gifts are gifts of healing. We think of gifts of healing primarily as physical terms and medical knowledge and skills that can cure our illness or heal our wounds or mend our bones. But healing includes more than just the physical. Our words to one another, our presence with one another, our prayers on behalf of one another are all a part of the healing process. They let the other person know that they are not alone, not forgotten, but are loved and attended and remembered. Let the favor of our God be upon us and confirm the work of the hands of those who patiently, diligently, and skillfully form these gifts for others who need solace, comfort, and support. Assure those who receive these shawls that they are not alone, nor forgotten, but are loved and remembered. Warm them in the embrace of your spirit. Comfort them by the closeness of your presence. Cradle them in hope. Grant them your peace. Wrap them in your love. This we pray in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. This time we'll ask the ushers to come forward as we uh, give our gifts back. And we're here in our stewardship time. We think about uh, what, what we want to give to the church, what we are giving to the church, what we are giving of our time. Um, we also think this morning about um, 
how we can offer ourselves to be helped to you. So this morning, it's during our off offering. If you'd like to come up, there's, if there's something that you need, one of these little prayer shawls for, one of these little prayer um, things that are on the altar here, you're um, free to take one. If there's no, someone in your life that you know that needs to know that they're not alone, that there are people who are praying for them, you can uh, grab those uh, this morning during our offering. Scripture reading for today is Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, 
yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So there is not a, a statement in our Apostle, Apostles' Creed that begins with, I believe in the Bible. There's a, a, a belief commitment about God, and about Jesus, uh, about the Spirit, about the church, uh, what we'll get into next week about uh, forgiveness of sin, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We believe in all of these things, but there's not a, that statement, I believe in the Bible. But we do, don't we? We believe in it. Uh, at least we're, we're very curious about it. It's a very complicated book. It's a mysterious book. Uh, but it's important. It's our book. Um, it's the, the church's book, the, the, the church universal. Um, it, it's important enough that starting last week in our confirmation class um, that meets on the second floor uh, right after this service, uh, we launched into the first of seven weeks uh, in talking about the Bible with our uh, confirmation class that is seventh grade and, and up, because it's important. And we, um, we talk about s some of the very interesting facts about the Bible. You may know them. The Bible was written over a course of 1,600 years, which covered 60 generations. Uh, the Bible was written by over 40 people. It included kings, fishermen, scholars, peasants. The Bible was written on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Uh, the Bible was written in different places like uh, prisons and palaces, uh, in the wilderness, uh, on the road. Uh, it was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. There's all of that. And yet we call it the Word of God. We say it every week. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. And we respond to that with gratitude. Um, so without question, even though uh, there's not this statement in the Apostles' Creed, uh, or, or many of our creeds actually, that says, I believe in the Bible, uh, the Bible is the primary source, like, like Rachel said uh, in the children's sermon. It's the primary source that has not only shaped the creeds of the church, but its prayers, uh, its liturgies, um, its, its sacraments. And so uh, I like to read um, at, at least a portion of like our official statement as United Methodists, because, you know, as we have been journeying through this, this series on uh, this, this credo series on these are the things that, that we believe, these are the things that we practice as Christian people, uh, to also put the spotlight on what specifically uh, does the United Methodist Church say about these things. And so, so this is um, uh, taken from our United Methodist Book of Discipline, which um, uh, has, you know, our, our kind of our rule of life for a denomination, uh, about Scripture and about the Holy Bible. Uh, it says, United Methodists share with other Christians the conviction that Scripture is the primary source and criterion for Christian doctrine. We believe the Holy Bible, Old and New Testaments, reveals the Word of God so far as it is necessary for our salvation. It is to be received through the Holy Spirit as the true rule and guide for faith and practice. Through Scripture, the living Christ meets us in the experience of redeeming grace. Through Scripture, the living Christ meets us in this experience of redeeming grace. From the very, from the very beginning, uh, the Methodist movement was, was marked by this, this passion and this deep desire um, to grow deeper in our faith and to grow closer to God. And it was intense. Like John Wesley was an intense dude. And he and his friends um, were, were so passionate about it, um, about following the ways of Christ and, and about having this, this specific the specific rule for life, that they were, they were mocked because they were so methodical. And so, and so you know, like, that's where the name of our denomination came. Like, it was a derogatory term. They were calling Wesley and his friends, these, these Methodists, making fun of them 
because they were so intensely committed to, among other things, the reading of the Bible. Uh, he, he was convinced, this thing that we've been saying week after week after week, that holiness, living a holy, godly life, is discovered uh, not uh, in the creed that we have proclaimed, but in the creed that we practice. And so uh, the everyday routine was critical. This everyday routine that was, that was intense and that was, that was passionate about growing closer to God um, in included every single day, not only the reading of Scripture, but, but the, reflect, the reflecting on Scripture. And Wesley would even say, like he would call this thing that we, that, that this Christianity that we're trying to live, this faithful Christianity, faithful to the covenant of God, he actually called that scriptural Christianity. And he talked about searching the scriptures as a discipline and as a practice. And I was a bit surprised to see this, but, but not really, that he likened the searching of scriptures as a means of grace, right up there with the sacraments, uh, with, with baptism and, and communion. Probably one of the distinct things that, that Wesley brought to uh, the life of faith and what he taught people was this expectation that God is going to meet you when you open the Bible and begin to read it, regardless what you find there, regardless how mysterious or challenging or disturbing or troubling, uh, God meets us there in transforming ways. Um, and they were committed to that. So you all know maybe that my Aunt Juanita died a couple weeks ago. Um, Aunt Juanita was my mom's uh, next oldest sister and the older sister right above her. Um, and she lived in Wilmore, Kentucky. Um, and um, Ross and I went and my dad went and my Aunt Posse, my mama's younger sister, uh, went. And so you know how funerals are. There was, there was kind of the, the little family reunion after Aunt Juanita's a pretty awesome uh, uh, funeral service. And so after, the, after the, the lunch in the fellowship hall of this tiny little church right on Main Street, at Main Street in Wilmore, Kentucky, which is just a little college town. It's, you know, it's a one-horse town or a one-stop-light town. You've got Asbury University, which used to be Asbury College, um, and you've got the Asbury Seminary there. Um, so my dad and Ross and I are walking from this little church um, back to our, our car. Um, you know, we're going to change out of the tie, and Ross and I are going to drive back to Waynesville. And my dad begins to take this trip down memory lane. 63 years ago, he said, I was walking these very steps. And we were walking uh, toward the, the, the campus of the, of the college and, and the, the beautiful front lawn with all the oak trees. And he said, I was, I was coming uh, right down the sidewalk. And he says, I was going to ask Ramona Cochran for a date. And as we walked and as we got to that place, uh, uh, he pointed over to the direction of where the, the Clyde Crawford, Clyde, Clyde, Glide Crawford, Glide Crawford dorm was, which is where my mom lived. Um, and there she was, standing under this huge oak tree in the front lawn. And he shared the memory. She said yes. She said yes to the date, and later she said, she said yes to the proposal of marriage. But there was this big problem with that. My dad was an uh, upperclassman. He was a senior. My mom was just a sophomore. Um, he was graduating. And he was, he was leaving to be a missionary in, in what is now Malaysia with the General Board of Global Ministries of, of the United Methodist Church. And he was going for three years. And, and this, was, this was back in the 60s. And so there wasn't FaceTime. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't the iPhone. Um, and so... They, they decided to, to set the wedding like weeks after he was to return. And so after three years, my mom hadn't seen dad in three years, and he gets off the boat, and uh, when she sees him for the first time in three years, um, she's stunned. Um, she's uh, shocked, actually, and, and kind of afraid because my dad was really thin, much thinner. And he was a skinny dude when he got on the boat three years before. Uh, he was going bald, like seriously going bald. I look just like my dad. Thanks, Dad. And 
he hadn't been spe speaking English for, for three years, and the, and the English that he was around was British English. So when he would, s would speak to her, he just seemed like this different creature, and so she had to look twice um, to make sure that she had, to r had the right guy. And so she's like, what, what was I thinking? Wh what am I doing? And um, she didn't call off the wedding, and I'm grateful for that too. Because she knew him. She knew his heart. And she had the love letters. In those three years, they wrote each other a letter just about every single day. A few years ago, before my mom died, um, she and dad got the, the box of old letters out and they began to, to read them together, um, kind of as a discipline. And, and I'm sure that it was, it was um, really great for them to remember the, the sweet memories of the, the life that they shared together because in these letters they poured everything. What was happening in the Cochran family in, in, it, in, in Georgia and what was happening in the t with the Termans in Mooresville. And, um, but also they were memories of probably the, the, the bitter times too, of the separation and, and all of the emotions uh, that, that went along with that. Uh, well, they... Um, they not only did this as a discipline together, just the two of them, but they shared the discipline with us. Isn't that crazy? So we would get the weekly letter from mom and dad, you know, just kind of the weekly update. And I, when I say we, it's me and my brothers and my, my uh, nieces and nephews and some of my cousins. Like it's a, it was, it's a pretty good mailing list. And they started attaching these, these letters that they had co copies of these letters from, from years ago, these love letters. And, and at first I'm like, what? You're sharing our, our, your love letters with us? But it was amazing because their, their letters reveal their love and reveal their faithfulness and, and reveal their covenant. And so it was this especially powerful thing for them, but it also has become a powerful thing for us. Like for us, um, it, it reminds us of our history, our family history, the, the whole family uh, throughout the 1960s or those years. Um, and it also gave us an example of what true love looks like. And so, you know, mom died almost three years ago and, and dad still gets the letters. He's not finished. There's still more in the box. And he reads them and he copies them and he sends them. You know, I know that, um, that this has brought him comfort, this, this discipline of, of reading the stories. I know that his, it has helped him to grieve well. I, I know that it has helped him to live well. Our text for today is maybe a really familiar one to you. When you really sit with it, it can be frightening, though. Um, there, there are really two major themes in this short passage um, a couple of different things that we could probably uh, grab hold of and spend some time on, but I really do think they're related. Um, the, the second part of it um, is this, this theme of we need this boldness to approach the throne of God. And, you know, like verse 16, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. But that comes on the heels um, of what the writer to, of the letter of Hebrews says uh, about... Um, the Word of God, the Word of God is, is living, and it's active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it, and it pierces, and it divides, and it just does stuff to our soul. Um, it judges our thoughts and our intentions. Uh, before Him, before God, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. I don't know how that makes you feel when you read that, um, but, but sometimes that feels kind of violent, you know? It's like violent imagery of the sword that's going to divide my soul and, and uh, bone from and joint from marrow, uh, and it can be kind of, kind of scary. But it's not like I'm, this, I'm afraid that this sword's going to come from the heavens and, and do me in, but it feels like that when I approach the throne of God and there's, there's darkness in my heart or there's sin in my life, 
If you're anything like me, I would rather just leave the book closed on the shelf and walk in a different direction and just try to forget about all that because I know as soon as I get in God's presence, it's going to come to the surface and uh, because I'm naked before God when I read the Bible and I have to give an account of the life that I'm living before God, right? But uncanny things happen. Maybe you know this. The kind of things that had happened to me, you know, uh, some people will just open the Bible, and where it opens, that's going to be the, the, the scripture for the day. Like, I don't know if you've ever done that. Um, I don't know that I've ever really done that intentionally a lot, but, but you've got to open, the, like when you're going to read the Bible, you're, you're opening it at, at some point, and how many times I've just, where it's open, like that first page, it might not even been where I was going. Like, that's what I needed for that day. Or the devotional book that I use. Maybe it's been put together in order and published, and it's years, maybe even decades old. And yet what was chosen for that day, August 17th, like that scripture that was, that was established in this devotional book years ago is exactly what I needed for that day. And, I, and, and how many times I've just looked up and said, well, like, how did that happen, you know? That this book becomes alive and it, and it speaks to me and it, and it holds me and it, and it, and it changes me. It's, it's the, the power of God's word. We open it and, and say whatever you'll say about the Bible and you know there's a lot of discussions about it. But the power of God is in this book. It is living and, and it is active. The truth in the scripture speaks to my untruth and, and it changes me. The, the vision of God's kingdom inspires me to truly live. It inspires us to truly live. And I'll give you the perfect example. In 2018, our Pancake Day committee uh, gathered to, which, like what they do every fall of the year, they sit around the table and they talk about the Pancake Day that's coming uh, at the end of February of the next year. In 2018, Steve Brown confirmed that he was the chair of the Pancake Day committee then. I know he's the one that, that found me in the hallway with deep excitement about what had happened. These folks sitting around the table, when they remembered one of the stories that Luke tells in his letter to Theophilus. In the Bible, Luke tells a story about Jesus being invited by Matthew or Levi to a banquet. And it gets Jesus in trouble because the wrong people are at that table. The wrong people are at the feast. And so the religious people see that and are kind of like, what are you thinking? The wrong people are at that table. Why did you even walk into that house? Like that's the story that, that Luke tells to Theophilus um, in, in, what, in Luke's gospel as we have it, this, this story of the, the great banquet. And so in 2018, thousands of years after that happened, our Pancake Day committee is, is telling that story. And it becomes transformative. You know why? Because they catch this glimpse of the kingdom of God and they begin to ask questions and bring those questions into the present. And the question was simply like, well, who's at our table? If they were at Jesus' table, who's sitting at our table? Does our table reflect the kingdom? And they fell under conviction, saying, as far as Pancake Day is concerned, probably not. And maybe it's because it's eight bucks a person, because it's a fundraiser. Tens of thousands of dollars, maybe $40,000, don't hold me to that. It's a lot of money is raised on Pancake Day, because about all of Haywood County comes, or so we thought. You know what they decided to do? And Steve Brown grabs me in the hallway after worship, after their meeting, and he says, Pastor Keith, I just want to know what you think about this. And he began to tell me this story that was born out of this story. We think we want to make Pancake Day free. And the chills ran down my spine or up my spine, however that works. The chills were working on me because I knew that the Spirit of God had been in a committee meeting. And Pancake Day was free trusting that all would be fine because it was spirit-led and God-led and, and uh, full of, of the story of Scripture. And that pancake day, those of you who, who were here, you remember it. It was like no pancake day like we've ever seen. And it's, there's been, what, 
65 of them. It's, it's a long-standing tradition. People of every sort, every race, every economic status. The table was full, and it transformed us. And I trust that it was transformative to our community and will be into the future. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't do much good if we just read the Word of God. If we just know it. It's helpful to know it. When the Scriptures are burned in our hearts, we remember them. We'll find ourselves in places where the Holy Spirit will bring the Scriptures to mind. Just like Jesus in the wilderness. He was being tempted. And you remember the story. Maybe you... You don't know the story. It's in, it's, it's in uh, two of the Gospels, Matthew 4 or Luke 4, and they're very similar. There were temptations that came in the wilderness, and Jesus' response to those was, was quoting the Scriptures, quoting the Word of God. It gave him strength, and it, and it empowered him. So it's very important for, for us to know it, but to know it just as knowledge. Um, what good is it to read it and just to know it um, if we don't actually live it? If we don't live the truth? Be the truth. Uh, John Wesley wrote a letter to this guy named John Trimbeth. He said, fix some part of every day for, for private exercises. Whether you like it or not, read and pray daily. It is for your life. There is no other way. Do justice to your own soul. Give it time and means to grow. Do not starve yourself any longer. Take up your cross and be a Christian altogether. Then, Wesley says, then the children of God will rejoice. Amen. It's time for our baptism, and we invite the Sonye family to come on up here. I'll introduce the family to you. Jared and Kelsey Sonye um, have three beautiful daughters, and we've baptized the older two. This is Willow, and this is Cora. And this is sweet Skylar, and so we're going to be baptizing Skylar today. And we have um, godparents as well, Brittany Pugh and Alex Tanner is here um, to witness the baptism today. So let us begin. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. And today we bring before you Skylar Ray Sonye. So parents, I ask you these questions. On behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so please say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? I do. Will you nurture these children in Christ's holy church? that by your teaching and example they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly and lead a Christian life. Mm -hmm. Now we ask all of you who are gathered here today, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Mm -hmm. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. 
we will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Let us all join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. It's an eyes open prayer. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and to Skylar Ray who receives it, to wash away her sin and clothe her in righteousness throughout her life, that dying and being raised with Christ, she may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Are you ready for this? <laughs> Skylar Ray Saunier, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now before we continue our liturgy, Skylar, I just want to tell you um, that we're doing this not because of anything you've done to earn it or deserve it. Um, it's because of God's grace and God's love. Um, it's, it's a free gift for us. Like uh, God loves us before we even know it. And the beauty of you being surrounded by your family and Alex and other friends and your church, which is us, mm -hmm, exactly, <laughs> is that we can help point you in some directions, like the Bible, like what we talked about today, to read the love letters of God and to know uh, that God has created you unique, like you are a special creation and gift <laughs> to the whole planet. And I'm excited uh, that, we, that we all get to watch you grow and become all that God created you to be. So God bless you. The Holy Spirit work within you 
that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Now it is our joy to welcome our new sisters and brothers in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. Members of the household of God, I commend Skylar to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of First United Methodist Church of Waynesville, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. All right, let's celebrate this. Just shout, clap. <laughs> Y'all can touch the water if you want to remember. We do that a lot as big people. <laughs> so if y'all have an opportunity to say hey afterwards, that would be awesome. Right. At this time, let's all stand as we, uh, we sing our closing song, one that reminds us of God's love and how it is constantly coming out.
Thank you all for coming today. And as we follow Liza Jean out of here, as we follow the light of Christ, uh, I want to invite you all to come um, and take one of the pocket prayer shawls. There are lots of them. I was also told that if you have a special need in your life uh, or uh, for yourself or for someone that you love or that you're praying for and you would like to take one of these uh, prayer shawls that are so full of love and, and, and so full, full of prayer that you're invited to do that. We have a lot of them, so um, if you get up here and there's not one left, now that's not a problem. So as we go, may we go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. God bless you and go in peace.